Welcome to Chapter 10, A Democratic Revolution from 1800 to 1844. Let's get started. The Rise of Popular Politics, 1810 through 1828. The Decline of the Notables and the Rise of Parties. Let's look at the Rise of Democracy itself. Expansion of the franchise, that means expansion of voting rights, was the most dramatic expression of the Democratic Revolution. Beginning in the late 1810s, many states revised their constitutions to give the franchise or the right to vote to nearly every white male farmer and wage earner. In America's traditional agricultural society, wealthy notables dominated the political system and managed local elections by building up supporting factions. Small-holding farmers and ambitious laborers in the Midwest and the Southwest launched the first challenges to the traditional political order. The constitutions of new states prescribed a broad male franchise, and voters usually elected middling men to local and state offices. To deter migration to the western states, the elites in most eastern legislatures grudgingly accepted a broader franchise for their states. By the mid-1820s, excuse me, only a few states, North Carolina, Virginia, and Rhode Island, required the ownership of freehold property for voting. Between 1818 and 1821, some eastern states reapportioned legislatures on the basis of population and instituted more democratic forms of local government. Americans began to turn to government in order to advance business, religious, and cultural causes. The parties will start to take command. As the power of the notables declined, the political party emerged as the organizing force in the American system of government. Parties were political machines that gathered the diverse agenda of, of social and economic groups into a coherent legislative program. Although the beneficiary of elitist education and financial support, Martin Van Buren advocated a political system based on merit, not privilege. Between 1817 and 1821, Van Buren created the first statewide political machine and he later organized the first nationwide political party, the Jacksonian Democrats. Keys to Van Buren's political success were his systematic use of party newspapers to promote a platform and drum up the vote and his use of patronage. He and his party made 6,000 political appointments in New York. Van Buren then used the spoil system to award public jobs to political supporters after an electoral victory. Van Buren also insisted on party discipline and required state legislators to follow the dictates of a caucus or meeting of party leaders. The election of 1824, um, also been coined by the Jacksonians as the corrupt bargain. With the democratization of politics, the aristocratic Federalist Party virtually disappeared, and the Republicans broke up into competing factions. The election of 1824 had five candidates who all called themselves Republicans. John Quincy Adams, John C. Calhoun, William H. Crawford, Henry Clay, and Andrew Jackson. Congress selected William Crawford as the official candidate, Yet the other candidates refused to accept the selection and sought support among ordinary voters. Adams campaigned on his success as Secretary of State. Clay promoted the American system, an integrated program of national economic development. Crawford advocated adherence to the Jeffersonian ideals, and Calhoun withdrew to support Jackson, a war hero and self-made man. Although Jackson received nationwide support, no candidate received an absolute majority in the Electoral College, so members of the House of Representatives had to choose the president. Clay assembled the coalition of congressmen that voted for Adams, and Adams repaid Clay by appointing him Secretary of State. Clay's appointment was a politically fatal mistake for both men. Calhoun accused Adams of using the power and patronage of the executive to the thwart the popular will, 
and Jacksonians in Congress condemned Clay for arranging this corrupt bargain. The last notable president was John Quincy Adams. The fate of John Quincy Adams' policies. Adams embraced the the American system proposed by Clay, protective tariffs, federally subsidized transportation improvements, and a national bank. Adams' policies favored the business elite of the Northeast and the entrepreneurs and commercial farmers in the Midwest, but won little support among southern planters and small-holding farmers who feared powerful banks and opposed inflation resulting from taxes. Well, actually, from tariffs. Congress approved only a few of Adams' proposals for internal improvements, such as a short extension of the National Road, because politicians believed such legislation was the prerogative of states. The tariff battle. The most far-reaching battle of the Adams administration came over tariffs. Adams' tariff of 1824 protected manufacturers in New England and Pennsylvania against imports of more expensive woolen and cotton textiles as well as iron goods. Disregarding Southern opposition, Northern Jacksonians joined with the supporters of Adams and Clay to enact the Tariff of 1828, which raised duties on raw materials, textiles, and iron goods. The new tariff enraged the South. As the world's cheapest producer of raw cotton, the tariff cost Southern planters about $100 million a year as planters had to buy either higher cost American textiles and iron goods or highly taxed British goods. Southerners thought the tariff was legalized pillage and labeled it a tariff of of abominations. Southerners also opposed Adams' Indian policy that recognized Native American land rights and advocated the negotiation of treaties. Adams was the last of the elitist politicians and refused to adjust to the new style of party politics. The Democracy and the Election of 1828 Martin Van Buren and the professional politicians handling Andrew Jackson's campaign had no reservations about running for the presidency. Jacksonians organized a massive publicity campaign advocating Jeffersonian political ideals and celebrated Jackson's achievements as a self-made man. Jacksonians initially called themselves Democratic Republicans, but eventually became simply Democrats and their name conveyed their message that through them, the middling majority, the democracy, would rule. Jackson's appeal as a candidate was his message of equal rights and popular rule, his hostility to business corporations and to Clay's American system, his animus towards Native Americans, and his personal preference for a judicious tariff. Jackson received 178 of 261 electoral votes and became the first president from a western state. However, the massive outpouring of popular support for Jackson frightened men of wealth and influence. The Jacksonian Presidency from 1829 to 1837 Jackson's Agenda, Rotation and Decentralization To decide policy, Jackson primarily relied on his so-called kitchen cabinet, an informal group of advisors. Using the spoil system, Jackson created a loyal and disciplined national party and dispensed government jobs to aid his friends and win support for his legislative program. Jackson's main priority was to destroy Henry Clay's American system. He rejected national support for transportation projects, which he also opposed on constitutional grounds and in 1830 he vetoed four internal improvement bills. The Tariff and Nullification Although opposition to the Tariff of 1828 helped Jackson win the election, a major political crisis saddled him with protecting it. To sidetrack the possibility that government would try to end slavery, South Carolina politicians tried to limit the power of the central government and choose the tariff as their target. The crisis began in 1832 when high-tariff congressmen ignored Southern warnings that they were endangering the Union and reenacted the Tariff of Abominations. In response, South Carolina State Convention adopted an Ordinance of Nullification, 
which declared the tariffs of 1828 and 1832 null and void and threatened secession. South Carolina's act of nullification rested on the constitutional arguments developed by Vice President John C. Calhoun, in which he maintained that the Constitution had been ratified by state conventions, and therefore a state convention to de- could declare a law, congressional law, if it affected states unequally, null and void. Jackson denounced this radical redefinition of the constitutional system, declaring that nullification violated the Constitution and threatened the Union of the United States. At Jackson's request, well, before we get to his request, the Webster Hain debates of 1830, Robert Hain, okay, he, he argued for states' rights. He was from South Carolina. Um, Daniel Webster of Massachusetts argued about national power. Hain advocated for nullification. In his second reply to Hain, Webster advocated national power. And one of his more famous quotes we've heard before, liberty and union now and forever, one and inseparable. So Henry Clay is going to come in, okay, and propose a tariff of 1833, reduce tariff rates by 10% per year for eight years. However, at Jackson's request, Congress passed a force bill authorizing the use of the Army and Navy to force South Carolina's obedience. At the same time, a tariff act was passed that gradually reduced the rates. That is um, Clay's compromise. And it reverted to the modest rates of 1816 by 1842, thereby eliminating another part of Clay's American system. South Carolina rescinded its, rescinded its nullification of the tariff, and Jackson established the principle that no state could nullify a law of the United States. The Bank War. Jackson's Bank Veto. By collecting notes and regularly demanding specie, which would be gold or silver to back um, money, the Second Bank of the United States kept state banks from issuing too many notes preventing monetary inflation and higher prices. Most Americans did not understand the regulatory role of the second bank and feared its ability to force bank closures, which left them holding worthless paper. In 1838, Jackson's opponents in Congress persuaded the second bank's president, Nicholas Biddle, to seek an early extension of the bank's charter with the hope of luring Jackson into a veto that would split the Democrats just before the 1832 elections. Jackson did veto the bill and became a public hero. He declared that the second bank promoted the advancement of the few at the expense of the many. Jackson won the election of 1832, jettisoned Calhoun as vice president, and chose Martin Van Buren instead. Now it's time for the bank to be destroyed. Jackson had Secretary of the Treasury Roger B. Taney withdraw withdraw the government's gold from the second bank and deposit it in state pet banks. The bank war escalated into an all-out political battle. Jackson's opponents in the Senate passed a resolution censuring the president for acting independently of Congress although Jackson ultimately won out. When the Second Bank's National Charter expired in 1836, Jackson prevented its renewal. Jackson had destroyed both national banking and the American system of protective tariffs and internal improvements. The result was a profound reduction in the purview and powers of the national government. Indian Removal Cherokee Resistance In the late 1820s, whites in both the West and East called for the resettlement of the Indians west of the Mississippi River. Indian people still controlled vast tracts of ancestral land and were determined to retain them. Several Native American peoples, such as the Cherokee, had established a bicultural society, created a written language, chartered a government similar to the United States Constitution, and some even owned slaves. 
mixed race Cherokees advocated integration into American society to protect property and ancestral lands. Setting Indian preferences aside, the Georgia legislature demanded a fulfillment of the promise to extinguish Indian land holdings in the state in return for its 1802 ceding of Western land claims. Jackson gave full support to Georgia. He declared states were sovereign within their borders and he withdrew the federal troops that had protected Indian enclaves. The Removal Act and its Aftermath Jackson then pushed through Congress the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which provided territory in modern-day Oklahoma and Kansas to Native Americans who would give up their ancestral holdings and the promise that they could live on the new lands in perpetuity. When Chief Black Hawk and his followers refused to move from their rich farmland in western Illinois, Jackson sent troops to expel them, which resulted in the army pursuing him into the Wisconsin Territory and engaging in the brutal eight-hour Bad Axe Massacre of 1832. Over the next five years, American diplomatic pressure and military power forced 70 Indian nations to sign treaties and move west of the Mississippi. In Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, the Supreme Court denied Indian independence. However, in Worcester v. Georgia, the Supreme Court voided Georgia's extension of state law over the Indians. Rather than guaranteeing the Cherokees' territory, the U.S. government took it from them. When a vast majority of Cherokees had not departed to the new territory by the deadline of May 1838, President Martin Van Buren ordered General Winfield Scott to forcibly march them 1,200 miles to the new Indian Territory, a journey remembered as the Trail of Tears. Though Seminoles were the exception, the national government had forced the removal of most eastern Indian peoples to the west. The Jackson Impact The Taney Court Although Jackson permanently expanded the authority of the nation's chief executive, using the rhetoric of popular sovereignty to declare that the president is the direct representative of the American people, he also reduced the power of the national government to eliminate the American system. Appointed Chief Justice by Jackson, Roger B. Taney, Taney persuaded the court to give constitutional legitimacy to Jackson's policies of anti-monopoly and states' rights. In the Charles River Bridge Company v. Warren Bridge Company, Taney's ruling undermined the legal positions of chartered corporations and encouraged competitive enterprise, thus challenging John Marshall's interpretation of the contract clause. In Dartmouth College v. Woodward, which had emphasized the binding nature of public charters. In 1837, Taney's decisions enhanced the regulatory role of state governments, Mayor of New York v. Milne, and restored some of the state's economic powers, Briscoe versus Bank of Kentucky. States revised their constitutions. Most states mounted a constitutional revolution extending vote to all white men, reapportioning legislatures on the basis of population, and mandating the election of officials. Most Jacksonian-era constitutions prohibited states from granting exclusive charters to corporations or extending loans and credit guarantees to private businesses and protected taxpayers by setting strict limits on state debts and encouraging judges to enforce them. Jacksonian populists embraced a small government outlook based on classic liberalism or laissez-faire, in public at least, they attacked government-granted special privileges and celebrated the power of ordinary people. Class Culture and the Second Party System The Whig Worldview Calhoun's Dissent The rise of the democracy in Jackson's tumultuous presidency sparked the creation of the mid-1830s of a second national party, the Whigs. Although a heterogeneous group initially, the Whigs gradually elaborated a distinct vision, a political world dominated by men of ability and wealth chosen by talent, not birth. Northern Whigs called for a return to Clay's and Adams' American system. Southern Whigs advocated economic development but did not support high tariffs and social mobility. Calhoun, 
the spokesman for the Southern Whigs, opposed social equality and suggested that slave owners and factory owners shared common enemies, enslaved blacks and propertyless whites. During the 1834 election, Whigs successfully appealed to evangelical Protestants and upwardly mobile Americans in New England and the Midwest and gained control of the House of Representatives. The Anti-Masons become Whigs. Many Whig voters previously were anti-Masons, a member of a powerful but short-lived political movement of the late 1820s. Whigs and anti-Masons shared convictions such as temperance, the American system, equal access to opportunity, and evangelical morality. In the election of 1836, the Whigs faced Martin Van Buren. Van Buren emphasized his opposition to the American system and his support for individual rights. The Whigs ran four regional candidates in the election in the hope of throwing the presidential contest to the House, which they controlled, but the plan failed and Van Buren won. Labor politics in the Depression of 1837 and up to 1843. Urban artisans and workers in several states formed working men's parties to express their discontent with elitist social and political order. Campaigning for a more egalitarian society, the new parties joined the Jacksonians in demanding equal rights and attacking chartered corporations and monopolistic banks. Although several working men's candidates won offices in cities, their artisan republicanism rhetoric, which emphasized proprietorship, impeded alliances with dependent wage earners. At this juncture, the Panic of 1837 threw the American economy into disarray. The panic began when the Bank of England sharply curtailed the flow of money and credit to the United States. To pay their foreign loans and commercial debts, Americans had to withdraw specie from domestic banks. Lacking adequate specie and a national bank on which to rely, domestic banks suspended all payments in specie. By 1839, the American economy fell into a deep depression. Canal construction fell by 90%. Prices dropped nearly 50%, and unemployment rose to 20% in some areas. The Depression devastated the labor movement in de by depleting the membership of unions and destroying their bargaining power. Some state courts also issued injunctions, orders that prohibited workers from picketing or striking. By 1843, most unions had disappeared. The election of 1840. The Whigs blamed Jackson's policies for the Panic of 1837, and as Van Buren had just entered office, the public turned its anger on him because he did nothing to stop the downturn. He had a nickname, Van Ruin, you might have heard me say. Van Buren's Independent Treasury Act of 1840 actually delayed recovery because it took specie out of state banks and put it in government vaults. In 1840, the Whigs nominated William Henry Harrison, the victor of the Battle of Tippecanoe, for president, and John Tyler for vice president. Harrison had little political experience, but the Whigs wanted someone who would rubber stamp their programs for protective tariffs in a national bank. The contest, the Great Log Cabin Campaign, was the first time two well-organized parties competed for the loyalties of a mass electorate. Using organized public events to draw in voters, the Whigs used the log cabin as an icon for their candidate. It was largely fictional, egalitarian tastes, and common background. The Whigs boosted their political hopes and their populist image by welcoming women, women to their festivities. Harrison was voted into the White House and the Whigs had a majority in Congress, but a month later Harrison died of pneumonia, so Tyler became president. The whole thing was is that Har William Henry Harrison's inaugural speech was like almost three hours, and he got pneumonia, and he died. Tyler subverts the Whig agenda. Tyler, who was more like a Democrat when it came to economic issues, was hostile toward the Second Bank and the American system and vetoed many Whig bills. The split between Tyler and the Whigs allowed the Democrats to regroup and recruit more supporters. 
The Democrats remained the majority party in most parts of the nation by drawing on ethnocultural politics, the practice of voting along ethnic and religious lines. Unlike most of the contemporary world, the United States now had a highly organized system of representative government that was responsive to ordinary citizens. So as a review, the corrupt bargain of 1824, Jacksonian democracy equals increased suffrage for white males, the tariff of abominations that set off the nullification crisis, the bank war um, that completely altered the economy, you could say destroyed the banking system and caused the panic of 1837, the whole idea about should the United States have an official bank, the formation of the Whigs, that party, and the Indian Removal Act and the Trail of Tears. That is it for Chapter 10, and until next time.